everybody, welcome to United. If you don't already know me, my name's Kara. And my name's Caroline. And here at United, we exist to point students towards Jesus. One of the ways we like to do that is through our Connect card. So if you look back, if you look at the seat back in front of you, you will see a card that looks just like this. And at the bottom, there's this portion called Connect. And basically that's for new students or relatively new students to connect with us. And so you'll fill it out. And at the end of the service, you'll go to the very back Connect room, which is straight back into the right from the bathrooms for one of our team members to meet you and even give you a free shirt just for being here. Now if you flip to the other side, there's a section called Sermon Notes and that's just for you to jot down anything that speaks out to you while our five students are preaching tonight. And at the bottom, there's a section called How Can We Pray For You? And that's for you to write down anything that you're going through or you know somebody else going through for our team to be praying for you throughout the week. Another great tool that Beach Students has for us to grow close to the Lord is devotionals that they post on their Instagram every day. So make sure you go check those out. And the great thing about devotionals is there's no right or wrong way to do them. You can simply listen to your favorite worship song every day or even read a verse today or recently like I've been doing, read your devotional book and you get to see what the Lord has to offer you each day. Yes, and also make sure you connect with Beach Students on all of our social media. Our username is at Beach Students, and it's a great way to stay up to date on any upcoming events or even just pictures from United. And if you miss a sermon or want to go back and watch it, they will be posted on our YouTube and our podcast, which is also at Beach Students. Now go ahead and turn to the person next to you and ask them if they're doing anything fun for spring break. because no I'm not so actually let's prepare our hearts as we transition to this time of worship and Caroline prays for us so if you will bow your head and close your eyes with me as I pray dear Lord I thank you for this day I thank you for the wonderful opportunity to be here in your presence Lord I pray that as we go throughout this sermon and through this worship you will just open our hearts to what you have for us you will just fill life through these speakers you will just help us to learn something new about you in your name I pray amen All right, let's stand to our feet of worship. Guys, I've missed you since ever. I'm excited to be back with you again. I think we all are just to worship God together in this place. So God, we give you our full attention. We give you our affections. We give you our devotion. For you are worthy of all praise, King Jesus. We honor you here in this place. Oh, 
your house but walked my own road then Jesus came
So let's just sing the verse. When something says I am guilty, I'll point to the price you pay. When something says I'm not worthy, I'll point to that empty grave. Just like Lazarus, oh, you brought me back to life. One more time, sing it out. When something says I am guilty, I'll point to the price you pay. When something says I'm not worthy, I'll point to that empty grave. Just like Lazarus, oh, you brought me back to life. Oh, if that's your story, lift up a shout of praise that he brought you back to life. It's no longer I who live, but Christ in me. Hallelujah. Awesome, awesome. Hey, grab a seat, grab a seat. We're so glad that you guys are here. Welcome to United. My name's Ryan. I'm the student pastor here at Beach, and uh, we got a special night for you guys. If you didn't know, first ever five for five. We're going to have five students preaching for five minutes each, and uh we, I, I, went, I saw a church that did this a few years ago, and I thought, I'm, we're going to steal that one day, and today's that day. So we're stealing it today. And we got five uh, high school students who have been preparing for the past month, five, six weeks with me, and have been uh, talking to God and seeing what he wanted, uh, wanted them to talk about. And they've been uh, preparing themselves and practicing and getting ready. Um, let, me, let me give you two quick things, and I'm going to pray for them, and then they're going to they're, they're gonna get started. The first thing is this. First thing is this, it is extremely difficult to get up in front of your peers when you're a teenager. Extremely difficult, all right? So here's what I want you guys to do. I want you to pay attention. I don't want you to be distracting. Y'all can, can do whatever you want in the, in the crowd when I'm preaching, and I'm just going to keep on preaching because, you know, I do it a lot, and I don't really care what you do out there. But when people that aren't used to being on stage see distracting things, it's distracting. So I want you guys to be clued in. I want you to listen to what they're saying. Take notes. Grab one of those cards on the seat backs in front of you. That's why they're there. Grab a pen. That's why they're there. Take some notes. This is not an adult preaching to you. These are other students preaching to you. And so pay attention. Be respectful. Listen to what God has put on their hearts. You get five for the price of one tonight. And second of all, second of all, and this is really important as well, this is not the voice. This is not a competition. We, I'm not voting one of them off at the end. I'm not gonna, y'all aren't gonna be like, oh, well, I like so-and-so. And, and so we're not gonna have conversations on the way out. Well, I thought so-and-so was the best because there's nothing worse than pouring your heart out and then having you compared to someone else that was up here. And so just don't do it. God's gonna preach through each of these students and we're not gonna compare and we're not gonna give them a point scale out of 10. We're just gonna listen to what God has for us and we're gonna appreciate what God has for us and that's it. Cool? All right, let me pray for them, and, uh, and then we'll get started with the first of five. Heavenly Father, I pray for each student that's sitting on this front row. I know that there's nerves like crazy, and that they're hyperventilating, and that their blood pressure is up, and their, their pulse is going through the roof, and, and they just don't want to mess up. Lord, I, I pray that they would know they can't mess up as long as they listen to the Holy Spirit. They may, not, they may not say everything the way they want to say it, and the way they practiced it, but Lord, if they follow the Holy Spirit, and they say what you called them to say, and they're confident in you, not in themselves, then, then that's all that matters. And they're gonna, they're, gonna, they're gonna preach something amazing that you've put on their heart. Lord, I thank you for the preparation that each of them has given to this. I pray that that preparation would pay off. And I pray that uh, each person in this room, whether a student or, or an adult, whether someone who's here for the first time or has been here many times, that we would all gain something from what they have to say, that we would gain something as they come up here with boldness and courage and humility and vulnerability, and that we would hear them and apply it to our lives. We ask this all in your holy and mighty name. And everybody said, amen. amen, amen. So first up, we got 12th grade boy, Riley Chonko. Give it up. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So tonight I'm going to be speaking about insecurity. And so to start, I want you all to think about a time where you felt you weren't good enough. Now, this could be a time you didn't make the cut for a team. Maybe someone said something incredibly hurtful to you um, or you didn't feel good about the way you looked or what you're wearing. Um, and I ask this question because no matter who we are, at some point in our life, we've all felt insecure. 
Um, and insecurity is simply this. Um, it's the feeling that I don't measure up, and this is a feeling that I've struggled with for a large majority of my life, and it's something that a lot of people our age struggle with. Um, we live in a world where suicide is the third leading cause of death among young people, and about 20% of all teens experience depression before they reach adulthood. And um, these numbers are just not indicative of a culture of people who is confident in who they are, who is secure in who they are. Um, they're believing these lies, they aren't worthy, and that they aren't good enough. Um, and that's the question that I'm asking tonight, is do you believe that you are good enough? Because for a lot of us, um, the answer to this is no. Maybe not all the time, um, but at least some of the times the answer is no. And how do we find the truth that this answer is actually yes? And I think we have to go to Ephesians 2.10, which says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And I really like the beginning of this verse where it says, For we are God's handiwork. Because it makes me think of art, like a sculpture or a painting. And as we know, art is incredibly valuable. And what makes it valuable is the time it takes to build this art, the material cost, but so much more is the design. Um, an artist takes so much pride in his work. He puts in so much time to think about what he wants it to be, creates it as he wants it to be. In the same way, God has done that for all of you guys. All of you are exactly as he wanted you to be. Um, and something else I was thinking about is just artists don't create work unfinished and put it in a gallery. In the same way, God did not let you be born unfinished. He created you exactly how he wanted you to be, and you're exactly as he wanted you to be, like you are finished work when you were born. You don't have to do anything to get that value. You are valuable from the moment you were born. And even more than this, the second part of this verse, it says, we are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That before we're even born, not only are we beautifully made, but there's a purpose for us, that we're not just here to live every day, wake up, but there's something more for us. He's given us a purpose, and that gives us value that there's something for us. Um, and this is just so important, um, accepting who God has created you to be, because the devil is going to try so hard to steal that from you, to steal that purpose from you, to steal that joy from you. He's done it for me for a long time, um, to, out, to drown out the truth of God that you are good enough, that you are worthy. Um, but we have to try so hard to speak that into your lives, even if you don't believe it, just every day, look in the mirror, Say, I am worthy and I am loved because that is the only way you can drown out the lies that the devil is trying to put on you to steal what God has in store for you. Um, it is so important to accept your value in Christ. And I think the real goal is knowing who created you and the value that gives you. Um, because for a long time, I struggled with the expectations that other people's put on me, whether it was getting a good enough grade or, you know, running a fast enough time during track or being funny enough. But Chasing after these things, you know, with your insecurity, you're going to try so hard to fill it, but no matter what you do, you're never going to be good enough in your own mind, and the only way to understand that you are good enough is that you believe that you are God's handiwork, that you are beautifully and wonderfully made, that there is a purpose for you. Um, and just speaking that over yourself every day is going to go so far that at some point you will start to believe it um, through that repetition. It doesn't happen ov overnight, it happens over time, and it's just that repeated process. Even when you don't feel it, you preach it to yourself, you have people that come into your life and speak that over you. It is so important to understand that who God says you are is greater than what anyone else says about you, no matter what you're feeling, no matter what you're going through, understanding that God's truth, that you are valuable, is so important. And so to close out, I want you all to get a pen from the seat back in front of you or under your seat, depending on where it is. I want you all to write on your hand the word handiwork. That way, um, at least for tonight, you will have that reminder that you are worthy and that you are valuable through God, that you are God's handiwork, you are his art, and that no one can take that from you. And uh, with that being said, I'd like to introduce Audrey Harrell to the stage to go up next. Hey, guys. What's up? Um, so tonight, I'm going to be talking about what hope is. Everybody say, hope is dope. Hope is dope. <laughs> yeah, so our definition of hope is wanting something that we don't have. It's our greatest desires. This could be money. It could be love. It could be sex, a relationship, desiring healing, desiring joy. It's anything where we desire a change in our present circumstances, longing for something more. You know, today we get so caught up in what's next. Where's the next party? Where's the next game? Where's the next big event? We're constantly chasing something that we deem as better, something that we think will fulfill us. And where our desires are, our discipline is. Where our, your mind is, your time is. But God's definition of hope is but God's definition of hope is being confident that something better is coming. It's trusting that God has something better in store for us. And that's Jesus. Jesus is hope, and hope is Jesus. 
He gives us the ability to see the future kingdom in the present moment, no matter what your circumstances may be. You may be in a dark place, but if you're grounded, if you're rooted in hope, you will overcome it. So Romans 8, 18 says, For I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Hope is not based on our feelings, it's not based on our circumstances, but it's based on the promise of God that glory will be revealed. I don't know what you walked in here facing today. Maybe you're feeling lonely, you're feeling defeated at the end of your rope, feeling like you're stuck in this endless cycle of pain. I was there before, um, Around the end of 2019, early 2020, I was, my depression was at its worst. I was really struggling in my faith. I was doubting God constantly, um, just who he was. Um, I was fearful to get out of bed, not knowing what's next. I was overwhelmed with uncertainty and loss. I was broken, and I was scared. And y'all, how we look at our situation, it matters a great deal, and it will dictate our feelings and our behaviors in, our, in response. Our perspectives are important. Our decisions and how we live our lives are based on how we see things. And y'all, our hearts are deceitful because I looked at my situation, and I made it seem as though it was the end, that I had nowhere else to go, that my life was over, that I was stuck. I asked God, why me? Lord, I've been so faithful. God, I go to United every Sunday. God, I go to Life Group every Wednesday. Lord, I went to Epworth. God, I pray. God, how do you expect me to have hope when I can't see a light at the end of the tunnel? God, how do you expect me to have hope when I feel bound to hopelessness? But God says, take heart. God says, come close to me. Come near me. God says, listen to me. Don't do all the talking, but listen to what I have to say. God says, read my word. Look at the guidance I've given you. God says, look at the people I've placed in your life. Look to your life group leaders. They're there for you. God says, dare to declare hope when things feel hopeless. Y'all, we must start choosing to put God first, even in the suffering, even in the confusion. That in our weakest moments, that he will speak to us the loudest. Because you know what I didn't know then was that everything that I was going through was unfolding and paving the way to who I would become today. And if you would have told me that a year ago I'd be up here preaching about hope, I would have said you were insane. And what I realized through my journey of walking to go with God and actually reading his word and going to my life group leaders is this. That hope does not erase our pain, but it does change our ability to endure it. It changes the way we look at our situation and the way we eventually overcome it. I want to remind your heart that Jesus, the king of kings, still and forever reigns. That he takes what the enemy means for evil and he turns it for good. That nothing is wasted. Nothing. Maybe you lost someone and you are feeling hurt. But that pain will not be wasted. Maybe a relationship or a friendship ended and you're feeling lonely. But that loneliness will not be wasted. Maybe you had this big expectation, this big dream and you didn't achieve it. But that pain will not be wasted. It is used for something greater. Our pain and our circumstances are carried by a good, gracious, loving God who will make a way of redemption and of healing. Because y'all, change will happen whether we want it to or not. But our hope should be grounded in the truth that he takes it all and he turns it for good for his glory. He's still in control, even during the chaos, even during the confusion, even during death, even during destruction, even during pain, even during the middle of your sin. Y'all, our hope should be grounded in the truth that we have a powerful God who will make a way. He has a plan and a purpose for our lives. The enemy doesn't stand a chance against our God. No matter how many times he's tried, our God has already won, and his kingdom will forever reign. And that's our hope. Thank you. Now I would like to welcome another 11th grader, Chase Van Kale. Oh. 
All right, what's up, guys? So the title of my sermon tonight is Change Your Life because that's what I want to help you do. And I know it's a big statement, but stick with me. Now, just by a quick show of hands, how many of you have read the Bible outside of church in the last week? Okay. The truth is, most Christians do not read the Bible outside of church in the last week. And that's okay, but it needs to change. I just want to share some stats with you real quick that show what reading the Bible consistently can do for you. Feeling lonely drops 30%. Bitterness in your relationships drops 40%. Alcoholism drops 57%. Feeling far from God drops 60%. And viewing pornography drops 61%. These are just some of the major issues that are going on in our current generation today. I want you to ask yourself a question. Are you happy? Are you happy with the way you live your life and the things you do that bring temporary happiness? And at first you might find yourself answering that question, yes. But as you think more about it, you might be questioning if you really are happy. These These stats show that reading the Bible consistently will change your life. Now, Back to that question. If you're going to parties and and doing drugs and sex and um, reading, sorry. (laughs) Um, If you are doing drugs and sex and you are not finding happiness in those things, maybe you're finding temporary happiness. But when you look back on it, you're not really happy. I want to share some scripture with you. 2 Timothy 3, 15 through 17 of the message version. There's nothing like the written word of God for showing you the way to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Every part of scripture is God-breathed and useful one way or another, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, and training us to live God's way. Through the word, we are put together and shaped up for the tasks God has for us. If we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, why are we not living like Jesus is our Lord and Savior every day? When Paul was writing this letter to Timothy, which was a young pastor he was discipling, he was in a Roman prison in a chamber awaiting his execution. He knew he was going to die, yet he was still proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ and the goodness that comes from it. So what excuses do we have? Is it because we're too lazy? Because we're addicted to other things like social media, scrolling on TikTok and Instagram. How many hours do we spend on social media and how many minutes do we spend with God every single day? Maybe the word is confusing to you and that's okay. Maybe you look at the Bible like a rule book. You think that it's not really going to bring you freedom or peace or joy. You think it's just something to manipulate your life. Maybe you're scared of the truth. You're scared for the Bible to tell you that you're not supposed to have sex with that person before marriage. Or maybe you're scared, or maybe you just don't have the true passion for Jesus in your heart at this moment. Um, I just want to share with you some of the ways reading the Bible consistently has helped me because I know some stats aren't just going to convince you. Reading the Bible has allowed me to see more value in my relationships in my life. It has allowed me to find peace in difficult times. And I think one of the no- most notable, noticeable things for me, in all honesty, is overcoming lust and pornography. And of course, I will be tempted every day, and I will fall short sometimes. But I have come a long way, and I am still coming a long way in overcoming those temptations. If you feel bonded to the sins of this world, and you feel like you want to change Start reading the Bible because it is going to change your life. And I can't convince you of it any other way and no one else can. You can only experience it for yourself if you try. And if you feel called, inspired to start reading the Bible now and you don't already, I want to warn you, it's not going to be easy at first. It'll feel hard. It'll feel difficult and it'll feel like an obligation. But with discipline and consistency, you will form a habit. Just like working out, you, if you say you're going to go to the gym five times a week, you have to go. You're not going to see progress a day or just a week. You have to go months to finally see progress. That's how reading the Bible is. You'll finally get to see how God is working and blessing you in your everyday life. How is he providing you? Um, 
Now, if you feel called, I want you to do a student devo each day this week. We're going to have student devos. Um, and if you can stay disciplined and consistent and you can do those devos, you can do it for months and months and you will finally be able to see your life change. And I want to end with a quote that I found true for me and I still find true every day. If you chase Jesus as hard as the things you think you want, you'll wind up with more than you'll ever need. Now if y'all would welcome Caroline Skipper from ninth grade. As people, we are not patient. We live in a world where we want things now and we want them quick because we get them quick. We have fast food, we have the internet, we have everything. And that comes a problem when it comes to waiting. Even though we have the choice to wait patiently or to wait impatiently, we often choose to wait impatiently. We post something on Instagram and we expect likes right away. We send a text and we want a response right away. Our snap gets open, and we want to snap right back. We submit that test, and we want the grade right back. And while we often find ourselves waiting on these worldly things, we also often find ourselves waiting for God. But we're not the only ones that have waited for God. While we wait for his prayers to be answered, his goodness to be fulfilled, and his promises to come to life, David waited 15 years to become king. God promised that he would become king, and it wasn't until 15 years later that he was anointed. Abraham waited 25 years for his son Isaac to be born. In Genesis, we see God telling him that his name would be turned into great nations. Yet it wasn't until he was 100 years old that he had a son. Jesus, the son of God, the promised Messiah, had to wait 30 years to begin his ministry. Well, he devoted his life to God throughout those 30 years. He still didn't show that until he was 30. And often when we wait, waiting leads to doubt. We post that post on Instagram no one likes it, and we doubt that it was good enough. We send that text, they don't respond, and we think that they're mad at us. Someone opens our snap, and they don't respond. We think that they hate us. So why does God make us wait? Well, God makes us wait to remind us who is in control, that God is in control, and that we're not in control, that it's his timing and not our own timing. And God makes us wait to put us in a position where we have to have faith in him, where we have to trust him, where we have to have that hope in him. But what do we get out of waiting? When Isaiah 40, 30 through 31, it says that even youths grow tired and weary and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary and they will walk and not be faint. Those who wait on the Lord will have their strength renewed, which is something that we can't do on our own timing. So if you get anything out of this tonight, I want you to remember that the wait is worth it because his timing is perfect. The wait is worth it because his timing is perfect. If we have things going on our own time constantly, we want, things, we want everything now and we want them quick, it's not going to work out. But if we wait for God and we wait for his timing, they will work out. And if we've seen God do this over and over again, why can't we trust him now? Why can't we trust that it will happen again? And that even through the waiting, there is hope. And even through the waiting, we can trust him. So we have the choice to trust God or to doubt God to go on our own time or to trust his time, to hope or to doubt, to trust or to fall. Next up, I'd like to welcome Chrissy onto the stage. Hey guys. Um, I want to start off with something to kind of tickle your brain. So I want you guys to think of a time in your life where if you've wanted something so bad that you've convinced yourself that it was going to happen. Like you just dreamt about it and you were like, well, I want this so bad. And like, I just planned the whole thing out and like, it's going to be a reality. Like it has to happen because I want it to happen so bad. And then... Think about if that has actually happened. Did it actually play out the way that you wanted it to play out? If it didn't, how did that make you feel? 
I want to kind of share a story of mine, something that happened to me this past year. I know a lot of high school seniors can relate to the huge stress of applying to college. Like, I mean, it's one of the most stressful things that you will go through in your entire life. Like, you don't know where you're going to end up. You're not, you don't know if you're going to get accepted. Like, you just don't know what it's going to happen. And so for me, while I was going through the college application process, I had set my eyes on the University of Texas. If you guys didn't know, that's in Austin, Texas. It's one of the most popular cities in the United States. It's so amazing. I literally fell in love with the college and everything. I thought I was going to major in advertising, have Matthew McConaughey as a professor, and that I was going to be in some big city church, and somehow I was going to find my way onto their worship team. And then all of a sudden, even though I convinced myself that this is where I was going to end up, I opened up my decision letter and I got completely denied. I mean like rejected. There was no way that I was going to end up there in the fall. It tore me down and I was just so confused. I just didn't know what I was going to do. I felt like I had to start all over. I want to turn to this verse. It's Proverbs 3, lines 5 through 6. It says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. I feel like sometimes we get so caught up in our own understanding, what we want so bad in life, what we think and what we're convinced our reality is going to be, that we kind of unknowingly close our eyes and close our hearts off to seeking the Lord, to actively hearing with our minds and seeking him with all of our senses to what he has for us to hear for him. And in that scripture, it says, in all of your ways, acknowledge him. This means consistently seeking the Lord in all of you do. It means trust in the Lord, lean to him. Now, have any of you guys ever done a trust fall? Yes, yes, maybe, no, it's really scary. But what is the scariest part of a trust fall? Is it the beginning, the middle, or the end? I'd say personally that the scariest part of a trust fall is the middle, the part where you cannot see behind you and you're falling and you don't know if you're going to fall on the ground and hurt yourself or if everything's going to be okay and you're actually going to get caught and that all of that doubt and everything that you were so scared of in the middle of you falling was just no big deal because everything was fine. I kind of want to relate to that, to the way that we live our lives. Like something doesn't work out for us and we're like, oh my God, like, uh, like I just don't know what's going to happen. Like everything's just like the, the world is just ending. Like I just don't know. And that's the part when we're falling, right? And we think that at the end we're going to hit the ground and that we're going to get hurt. But no, God wants you to go to him. God wants you to seek him because guess what? He is always going to catch you. You are always going to be okay in the end. And I want to relate this to the rest of my story, my college journey. Um, This past February, I was opening my decision letter to FSU. And to be honest, I did not want to go to FSU. Like, I hated on it the whole time. I was like, heck no, I'm not going to end up at FSU. Like, why would I ever go there? Like, I want to go far away from home. Like, no, 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 no. That's like the last college I would ever go to. And then I had been openly seeking God. I was like, okay, God, like, just put me wherever, you know, you need to put me because, like, obviously he's not in Texas. And so, um, (laughs) and so basically, I opened the letter and it was like all this confetti. And then I was like, yeah, yay, FSU 2026. And something in me was like, hey, like, this is your place. This is actually where you're going to end up. And I kind of shunned it. I kind of didn't want to believe it. And then I realized that, dang, that is my place. And that is where God is calling me. And I want to bring this one up to you guys. It says, trusting in God requires that we don't do it our own way. And 
I don't, I don't want to go to FSU. Like, I'm still kind of eh about it, you know, whatever. But, like, I'm actually really excited about the way that God is going to move in my life. He's going to set my path straight at FSU. I may not be happy there, and he might work there. I might have to transfer somewhere else. But you know what? I'm going to fall without looking back. I'm going to fall without doubting because I know that he is going to catch me. And so I just want to end off with this. I want you guys to ask yourself this question. What area do I need to trust in Jesus rather than relying on what I want? I'm going to hand it back to Ryan. Yo, can we give it up for all five students? Let's go. Let's go. That was awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you all so much for sharing your heart and and for being bold and getting up here. Y'all did an amazing, amazing job. And um, thanks so much for putting yourselves out there. I appreciate it so much. and uh, man, that was awesome. That was awesome. I love, love hearing all those different stories, all those different perspectives, all those different words that God put on each of their heart. And it's cool. Like when they first came a month ago, like they didn't bring like all the same stuff. I didn't tell them what to preach. Like they all came with something that God had been putting on their heart. And to see it come to fruition was, was really cool. Um, we're going to close in a time of worship. And, uh, and usually you have one word to respond to this this week you get five and so I feel like everybody's got to have felt something from the Holy Spirit um, if not from one speaker then from another um, because there were five different things and so I really believe that he might have spoken to five different things in each of our hearts and uh, and so we'll close the way we, we always close we're going to close with a time of worship through song and um, and as always we have uh, these uh, these prayer rails up here that you can come pray at and you don't have to come here to pray, but this is a, an opportunity for you to get your posture different, to go from standing to kneeling down before God um, and just submitting yourself to Him. Um, and I think another thing I wanna just encourage you guys, we say it every week, but, but I know that some of you feel pressure. You don't have to stand during worship. You could sit, um, you can stand, you can sing, you can lift your hands, you can close your eyes, you can, you can do really whatever you want. Here's, here's what we want to encourage you to do. Just be engaged. Be engaged in what God's speaking to you. Be engaged in listening to Him. Be engaged in the words that are on the screens. Um, and and as, we, as we close this time, I just want to encourage you, whatever God put on your heart tonight, to really talk to him about that. Maybe you jot a note in your phone, maybe you write something down on your notes, but, but I just wanna encourage you to not just take the word, but to do something with the word. Let me pray real quick and then uh, we'll, we'll close in a time of worship. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the words that were sown by each of these five students into the group of people in this room. Lord, we know that um, you gave them that word and you brought it to fruition and you you put it into this room tonight. And so um, I I pray that whatever it is that we heard from the Holy Spirit, whatever topic resonated with us, even if it was none of the topics, but like the Holy Spirit just spoke something different to us. Lord, whatever it is, whatever it is, I pray that we would pay attention, pay attention, pay attention to what you said, that we'd apply it to our lives, that we would trust you with it. I pray over this, these next few minutes of worship that you would, you would break down some walls, that you would speak some truth to us, that you'd help us know where to go from here. Connect us with your heart and your name. Amen. Let's worship together. God, we turn our eyes towards you during this time. We don't want to miss what you're speaking. We don't want to miss how you're moving, Lord, in our lives. And so, Father, we run to you. We turn to you. Holy Spirit, move in this place as we reflect and as we rest in your voice and what you're speaking to each and every one of us, Lord. We worship you.
invitation to let it all go and I see it now I'm laying it down and I know that I need you I run to the Father I fall into grace I'm done with the hiding no reason to wait my heart needs a surgeon my soul needs a friend so I run to the Father again and again and again and again and oh 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 you saw my condition had a plan for the soul your son for
again and again Again and again You're everything we need You're everything we need Again and again and again and again Everything you need is in the arms of the Father Everything that you've been searching for, that you've been longing for, can be found in the arms of Jesus. That worth, that patience, that guidance, everything that all these students talked about tonight, everything is found in the presence of Jesus. So Holy Spirit, we lean into you tonight even when we don't see it, even when we don't feel it, Lord. Pour out your spirit as we sing of your love. God, we thank you for the hearts that you're healing. I'll keep running. I'll keep running. I'll keep running.
lesser things. We have run after lesser things than what you have for us. We have strayed from the path, God. But we're coming back. We're coming home. Our eyes are fixed on you because none of those things can satisfy. We catch them and we realize that they were empty the whole time. God, but when we get a glimpse of you, just a glimpse, it's more than enough more than enough. Who else can satisfy the longings of our soul than you, Jesus? So we cling to you. We run after you. We seek you with all of our heart, all of our mind, and all of our soul. Because only you can satisfy We love you, Father. Amen. Amen. Hey, guys. I just wanted to come up here and share something that stood out to me throughout those five amazing sermons, and that is that even though they were all different, they all had one common denominator, and that is that we can't do things our way, whether that's our way of viewing ourselves, our plan for our lives, our timing, the way we want our lives to go, or just the way we spend our time, it's not the best way, and that God's way in the best way, and as Caroline Skipper said, it's worth the wait. I completely agree, Kara, and that being said, I just want to take a minute to realize how great of an opportunity this was to hear from five students that are our age and are in the same circumstances that we are and I think that we should take that to advantage and just go throughout this week and the rest of our lives remembering that and each point that they made it out to make. Yeah, that's so true, Caroline. And I also want to give you all one last reminder that if you are new and haven't already filled out that Connect card, that you go ahead and do that now so at the end of the service you can go to the back Connect room and get your free t-shirt. Also, next Sunday we will not be having United due to spring break, but we will see you this Wednesday for Life Groups. Woo! Peace.